Um, but as you turn to Mark chapter seven, let's pray and let's trust for, for God to do, for God to continue to do what he's already started this morning. Father, thank you, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you, Lord. We just soften, quieten our hearts more than anything, more than singing great songs, more than preaching the word. We wanna encounter you. We wanna know that we've met with the living God. I thank you that you are here, Holy Spirit, that you are already working in hearts and lives. And Father, I pray that as this word comes, it would only enhance what you are already doing. I ask, Father, that my words would fall to the ground, but may your words, may your intent take root in hearts this morning. And Jesus, we pray that you would receive all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Mark chapter seven. I love the contributions that Candace and, and Jonathan and others brought because it really does um, go in line with what I was sensing, what I am sensing this morning. I, I, I'm, I, I, as I was praying for today, I, I sensed that there are some here today who who have a cry in your heart to the Father, to God, that you know only He can answer. And I sense that there might be others here today who uh, are facing a seemingly, over, a seemingly impossible, certainly an overwhelming set of circumstances that you need God to, to break in. And, and, and it's God's voice that you wanna hear. And, and it's God that you need to break in because even if you don't want to admit it, I suspect some of us here have, have looked everywhere and tried everything, but we've, we've found that that's been shown to be wanting every single time. But the question that I want to kind of ask and, and try my best through this passage to answer is, is how do we approach God with these burdens that are on our heart? How do we approach God with this cry that we know that only he can answer. If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, you might remember the disciples accusing Jesus of, of letting them drown when they faced a particular storm. That's unfortunately how some of us approach God with a, with a tone of accusation as if he's not caring and that nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus cares infinitely for where we are at. And then that story that we read or that we learned a couple weeks ago, immediately Jesus steps in and he calms the storm. But then he turns to his disciples and he asks, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In Matthew's gospel, we read another account of the disciples facing a storm. And remarkably in this one, Jesus walks upon it. And perhaps even more remarkably, he calls Peter out of the boat and Peter does exactly the same. But as soon as he's, as he's out on the water, he looks around him and notices the wind and the waves and he begins to sink and he cries out to Jesus, Jesus or Lord, save me. And again, immediately, Jesus calms the storm and saves him. But then he asks this question, why do you doubt? Why such little faith? No faith, little faith. In John chapter 16, Jesus tells his disciples, Jesus tells us this, he says, in this world, you will have trouble, you will face storms, but take heart, have courage. Courage, friends, I, I, I feel so strongly is the word that the Lord is speaking over Anthem Church in this season. Take courage, he says, I have overcome the world. And so when we read that verse, we have to ask the question, why then did the disciples have no faith or at least, at, at best, have little faith? And is that perhaps the attitude of our heart with which we come before the Lord? I am convinced that for those of us who follow Jesus, he wants nothing more 
than for us to trust him, for us to take him at his word. He, he wants us to know that he is good and faithful as Debs spoke about, and that when we go through storms, he is uniquely and specifically screening and filtering the severity and the nature and the timing of every storm so that in him we can come through victoriously. He wants us to know that every storm is an opportunity for us to learn how to trust him, for us to, to trust him deeper and deeper in our hearts. He, he, he wants us to know that he is always with us, closer than many of us perhaps realize. He wants to teach us how to stand on his word and how to worship while we wait and how to learn to fix our eyes on him and how to learn to walk in step with the Spirit. And he wants to teach us how to pray. I, I find it remarkable in my, for my own life, and perhaps you've experienced this too, that when we go through storms, it's remarkable how we realize that we have capacity to pray. But the question still remains. The question that I, I wanna ask and hopefully answer is how do we approach God? How do we approach God with this desperate cry that is on our hearts? How do we uh, uh, approach Him and, and cry out to Him so that we can see Him and Him alone breaking into those impossible situations? It's certainly not approaching Him with no faith. And it's certainly not approaching Him with little faith. But what we're going to learn today is that there is a measure of faith and, and friends, let me say, we can't get away from the fact that Jesus measures faith. There is a measure of faith that we're gonna learn about today that Jesus refers to as great faith. But I wanna be very clear from the beginning. Jesus' measure of faith is not how much we trust in him, but how we trust in him. It's not a measure of the quantity of our faith, but it's a measure of the quality of our faith. And in Mark chapter seven, we're gonna learn that there are specific characteristics of great faith. Now, before we get to the text, just to uh, remind us and perhaps just to introduce to some who are here for the first time, we are, as a church, walk, walking our way through the book of Mark in a series that we have entitled Step Into God's Story. It's an invitation for each and every one of us to, to follow Jesus, to, to be with him so that we can become like him in order to do the things that Jesus is doing, in order to, to ensure that the good news of the gospel that is at work in us can overflow from us to those around us by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's in essence what we are trying to, to, to accomplish. That's what, we, that's what our prayer is for this series. So with that in mind, Mark chapter seven, and we're gonna be starting at verse 24. Mark seven, Verse 24 is where we're gonna begin. And it says, Jesus left that place where he was ministering. He left that place in the province of Galilee and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, Tyre is a region just northwest of the province of Galilee where Jesus had been ministering for this, this time. But, but what's significant, and we're gonna take some time just unpacking this, this is not just a geographical relocation of Jesus's ministry. He's stepping into Gentile territory. He's stepping into a region and a place that is antagonistic towards Jews. One commentator suggested that Tyre was the Las Vegas of its day, and no offense to any people who might be here from Las Vegas. Uh, apparently, what happened in Tyre stayed in Tyre. That's the, that's the kind of condition of, of the, the, the city. But, but most importantly, what Jesus is beginning to reveal to his disciples and what he's beginning to reveal to us is that he is not just a Jewish Messiah coming to save the nation of Israel, but he is the savior of all people from all nations and across all generations. Now, before we go any further, I, I, I need us to pause, and I wanna pin a thought on this imaginary whiteboard that's behind me. Imagine this is a whiteboard, and we're pinning a particular thought. And this is the thought that I want us to, to uh, ta-da. <laughs> all right, it's not coming up. Imagine there's a whiteboard next to me. 
this imaginary whiteboard that's just to my right. And the thought that we wanna pin to this whiteboard is this. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. There it is. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. That's the, that's the thought that I want to pin onto this imaginary whiteboard and for you to hold on to, because we're gonna come back to it in a little while. The vast majority of Jesus' ministry for the three years that he, were, that he was ministering was, pr was primarily to the Jews. But this is important, never at the exclusion of the Gentiles. It was for the purpose of reaching the Gentiles. That was always God's intent, stretching right back to Genesis 12. Where, 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 where God speaks to Abraham, the father of, of the nation of Israel. And he says to him, I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna pour out my favor upon you and you are going to, to, to be a blessing and all people on earth will be blessed through you. More specifically in Isaiah chapter 49, the prophet Isaiah, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah to the nation of Israel and he says this, I will make you a light for the Gentiles. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So, so friends, it's very important that we understand that the focus of Jesus' ministry was primarily to the people of Israel. But every now and then, like him stepping into the region of Tyre, he hints at, or more to the point, he reminds or he reinforces the fact that God's heart is for the nations. You might remember, if you know your Bible, if you know the New Testament, in John chapter four, Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan woman. Samaria was at odds with the, with, with the nation of Israel. And to the Samaritan woman, he says, Salvation is coming from the Jews, speaking of himself. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, irrespective of ethnicity, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kinds of worshipers that the Father seeks. In John chapter 10, Jesus says this, I have other sheep, he is the great shepherd, and he says, I have other sheep, speaking of the nations, that are not of this sheep pen, that are not part of the nation of Israel, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. But unfortunately, if, again, if you know your New Testament, you know that the nation of Israel rejected Jesus by and large as their Messiah. In John's gospel, he actually preempts this. He, 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 he speaks about this in the opening chapter. He says, speaking of Jesus, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. But listen to this, yet to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. Beautiful verse. And so before the cross, Jesus was ministering primarily to the nation of Israel, but after his death and resurrection, there is, a, there is a significant, there is an unequivocal shift in his ministry now through his church to reach the nations of the world. Matthew 28, I'm sure most of you here know this well. Jesus says to his disciples and to us, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter one, Jesus says something very similar. As the Holy Spirit is about to be poured out upon his church, he says, you will be my witnesses, not just in Jerusalem or Judea, but also to Samaria and the outermost parts of the world. And so again, friends, the, the headline that I wanna pin here or, or here, the headline that I wanna pin on this whiteboard is this, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And you'll see why this is important in a few moments. Paul actually says that in Romans chapter one, verse 16. He says, the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Why everyone? He tells us in Romans chapter three, because all have sinned and fall 
and have fallen short of the glory of God. Yet all are justified freely. All are declared free of the guilt of sin by God's undeserved grace that came to us through the death of Jesus Christ. And Paul adds, it is first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Friends, if you are here today and you are not a follower of Jesus, can I say that right there is a summary of the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God, but through Jesus' death and resurrection on and from the cross, by faith in him, we are reunited to God the Father. And if you are here today and you are not a follower of Jesus and, and, and that truth resonates in your heart, friends, I wanna pray for you after the meeting. I wanna pray that you would be th- reunited with God the Father through faith in Jesus. And so back to our text, back to the passage that we are looking at in Mark. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. We're not told why. Maybe he wanted to rest for a moment. Maybe he wanted to spend some time with his disciples, preparing them for the journey back to Jerusalem and his ultimate death on the cross, which we are obviously gonna remember and reflect on next Friday and next Sunday. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. Don't you love that? He could not keep his presence secret. Word about Jesus in Mark chapter three had already begun to to get out into the region of uh, Sidon and Tyre, the region where Jesus now is. Verse 25, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia, She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Matthew chapter 15 tells us a corresponding story, and I'm just gonna grab a few verses from there. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My my daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. And so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. And then two verses later in in Matthew's gospel, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Have you ever wondered what intercession is? This is it right here. Intercession is coming to Jesus and crying out to him for mercy on behalf of someone who doesn't know how to do it for themselves. And friends, that's what every one of us as followers of Jesus are called to do. That's what Ansem Church is called to do on behalf of the city and nation, to cry out to Jesus on behalf of those who don't know how to do it themselves. In Mark chapter chapter seven, verse 27, Jesus says, first, let the children, this is what he replies, first, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. In in Matthew's gospel, he said, a woman, you have great faith. Not the little faith or the no faith of the disciples, but you have great faith, your request is granted. And then in verse 30, she went home and she found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. If you are not a little offended or at least a little uncomfortable with what I've just read, I suspect you might have dozed off for the last five minutes. I mean, this is not an easy passage to read and it's not an easy passage to certainly unpack. He has a mom whose little girl is being tormented by demons. If you're struggling to to relate, parents, think of your little boy or little girl struggling with a deathly illness. And if you are not a parent, then I want you to think of your sibling in that situation. And if you are an only child, then think of your best friend. We could always make this less hypothetical and I could ask you, and maybe you should do this, to think of that overwhelming or impossible situation or circumstance that you're facing. 
and you bringing that before the Lord and laying that at his feet. The mom falls before Jesus' feet and cries, Lord, have mercy on me, help me. You don't need a sermon to understand those words, do you? Lord, have mercy on me, help me. But at first read, and perhaps you might have felt that you've experienced this, at first read, Jesus seems to ignore her. His answer is hard to swallow or hard to understand, and that's me being generous. And so let's take a look at this text. Let's, let's work our way through this text to try and understand Jesus' response. And as we do that, we're gonna learn a few characteristics about this great faith that this woman uh, had according to Jesus. Firstly, great faith is desperate. Great faith is desperate. I struggled all week over that word. I, I, I so wanted to make it more palatable. But I, I felt yesterday, I literally settled on this word yesterday, I felt that we need to understand, I believe this is true, that great faith is desperate. Think about all that this mom was against and think about the fact that she pushed through all of that. She didn't care what people th thought, she pushed through, she was desperate to get to Jesus and to take hold of what she knew that only he could give her. Her culture was against her. Pagan Gentile women were not allowed anywhere near Jewish rabbis. The disciples were against her. We read what the disciples' response was in Matthew chapter 15. Eugene Peterson describes it like this. He says, stop bothering us. Jesus, tell her to stop bothering us. Would you please take care of her? She's driving us crazy. Certainly not painting the disciples in any good light. Satan was against this woman. And at first read, it seems like Jesus was against her too, but she pushes through all of that. She didn't care what anyone thought, only to fall at Jesus' feet and to cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, help me. When was the last time that you and I went to any lengths to do whatever it takes to take hold of what we know only Jesus could give us? When last did you fall at Jesus' feet? When last did you cry out in desperation to him? Is desperation for Jesus reflected in how you pray and in how you live? Or has our culture muted our desperation for Jesus? Is Jesus now alongside many other things? When last did you not care what other people think? When last did you courageously push past what culture wants you to be to take hold of what only Jesus can give? I can't say this for you, but I can say this for me. Sometimes I get desperate over the fact of how not desperate enough I am. Great faith is desperate. Secondly, great faith is persistent. Look at verse 26, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her. Some translations say she kept on pleading or she asked Jesus repeatedly. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus teaches us as we, uh, uh, to, to, to approach God by asking to, to seek and to knock. But in fact, that passage in Matthew chapter seven, if we understand the original language, Jesus is teaching us way more than just ask, seek, and knock. He's actually asking, teaching, for us to ask and keep on asking, to seek and keep on seeking, and to knock and keep on knocking. There's a, there's a persistence, there's a perseverance that Jesus wants to teach us as we pray and as we approach God. Because friends, when we approach God by asking and seeking and knocking, we, we get way more than what we necessarily were expecting. Not only do we get what we were asking God for in God's timing, assuming we were praying to God's will, according to God's will, but we also get to spend time with the Father. And we begin to learn to, to know Him as friend and as Father. Imagine if God gave you, gave us everything we asked for immediately when we asked for it. 
we would, he would totally be reduced to just a cosmic butler adhering to our every need. And that's not the kind of relationship that God wants with us. Elsewhere, Jesus teaches us to pray, give us today our daily bread. If God just gave us a stockpile of everything we need, I guarantee, and I say this for myself, maybe not for you, but I guarantee it would affect my relationship with God because I would have everything here and God would be off to the side. Friends, the point I'm, I wanna drive home is that great faith, great prayer, is as much about the journey and growing in relationship with God as it is about the destination of taking hold what only Jesus can give us. And so friends, this mom is both desperate and persistent, which makes Jesus ignoring her and his initial answer all the more shocking. Because at first it seems like Jesus actually is on the side of culture and is on the side of religion and is on the side of the disciples by completely dismissing this woman. Look at verse 27. First he says, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Let me tell you, if ever there was a time for a preacher to say, bruh, this is it. <laughs> what? is going on here? I was joking with someone before the service and, and I was saying like, who actually put this preaching schedule together and gave me this passage? And I realized it was me who put this preaching <laughs> schedule together. This is, this is a challenging text. Back in South Africa where Debs and I are from, we spent about eight or nine years at the church that ultimately planted us out here into Chicago. And there was a, uh, the, the, guy, the guy and his wife, Terry and Sandy Kruger, who led the church at the time. I, I, I wanna be, uh, I'm being, I wanna be intentional when I say this, but, but I don't wanna gloss over the phrase that I'm about to use because I think this phrase has been misused. But honestly, he is a father, to, a, a father in the faith for, for both of us. This man saw something in us and called it out. But let me tell you, there were times when he was incredibly offensive. To, to Debs and I. I remember the, the one time Debs, uh, uh, she had just given birth to Rebecca, our oldest daughter. It was a Monday. Debs had a C-section. That was the Monday. On the Wednesday, we had the church weekly prayer meeting. I called Terry. We had never missed a prayer meeting in all of our life at being at this church. I called Terry on the Wednesday, two days after she'd had a cesarean section, and I said, hey, TK, just letting you know that we're not gonna be at prayer tonight. To which he replied, sure, just don't make a habit of it. <laughs> there was another time when we were with, there was another time when we were on the eldership team, everyone else on the eldership team had marketplace jobs. And we were saying to Terry, Terry, we are tired. To which he replied, you only think you're tired. <laughs> or my personal favorite, <laughs> He, as if that's not bad enough, he insisted that every single one of us, husbands and wives, marketplace elders, eldership couples, husbands and wives for a season came prepared with a brand new sermon every Sunday, even if we didn't get to preach it, just in case God decided to take the meeting in a different direction. And as I say, we all had marketplace jobs. I had a pile of unpreached sermons. But friends, as offensive as, the, as that sounds, somehow he knew what was in us. Somehow he had a sense of something within us that we never were able to see needed to be called out and coaxed out of us so that we could become the leaders that we are today. So that we could become the, the, the couple and the kind of family that was willing to leave our everything we knew to plant a church in a city we had never lived in. And the same thing is happening here with Jesus and this woman. He's not rebuking her, and he's not insulting her or dismissing her. He's provoking her self-understanding because he knows exactly what's in her heart, and he's calling it out of her. A couple of weeks ago, I said, that I said something which I wanna use again in this context. Jesus is not testing her to the point of failure, He's testing her to the point of faith, to the point of her leaning in and taking hold of what only Jesus can give her. To which I wanna ask, are you offended at Jesus for something? Because maybe that's the very area you need to lean into to discover what actually is in your heart and what God wants to bring out. 
What do we remember about this woman 2,000 years later? Her great faith. Because Jesus called it out of her. But there's something else that's happening here. He's using this moment, verse 27, to tell a very short parable. Now a parable is when Jesus would compare two things, using language of the day to drive home a kingdom truth. And he's comparing children with dogs. Who are the children? Well, the word that is used in the original Greek speaks of biological children. What Jesus is talking about are the children of God, are the nation of Israel. Well, then who are the dogs? Well, the nation of Israel would often use the term dogs to describe the Gentiles. Now, let me tell you, that is not a compliment. We might consider that a compliment in our dog-crazed culture of today. I mean, honestly, you can walk up behind someone who's pushing a stroller and you're not 100% sure whether that is a dog or a human baby. Now, I I don't wanna offend anyone here, so let me perhaps move on. But but friends, the, the point is, is that this mom knew the reference. But here's what's so amazing. Jesus takes the sting out of the word dog. He doesn't use the word stray dog, which is the common uh, uh, word spoken about Gentiles. He uses the word meaning puppy. It's not, it's not an insult. It's actually, it's an invitation to, to lean in, to draw something, to, to, to draw closer to him. It's not written in the text, but I suspect Jesus said that with a wink. And I suspect the tone of his voice was calling her closer to him. But friends, the key word in verse 27, look at the the verse. The key word is the very first word, which is the word first. Remember the whiteboard? First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. What he was doing was he was reminding her of the order of his ministry. First let Israel eat at the table, then it would be time for the nations to feast. Now, how would you respond to that? Would you walk away? Would you be offended? Look at verse 28. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's bread. Thirdly, great faith is great because it trusts in a great God. Great faith is great because it trusts in a great God. What is she saying? She's saying, Jesus, I know that your banquet table of goodness and grace and power and mercy and love, your banquet table of your kingdom is huge. And therefore, I know that there is enough for me to feast on too. She's saying, I know who you are, Jesus. And I know that even scraps off your table is enough to heal my daughter. So I'm not going away empty handed. That's the reason why you and I only need to have faith the size of a mustard seed. Because we we worship and we trust in a God who spoke the universe into being just with the word. And the God who still speaks into existence things that are not. That's why Romans chapter eight, verse 11 says, anyone who trusts in the Lord will never be put to shame. It's why great faith is not a measure of how much you trust in God, but rather how you trust in God. But lastly, there is a humility to her response. And so fourthly, I wanna suggest that great faith is also humble. As a nation, as a people, as a culture, we are an assertive people on the basis of our rights, aren't we? And I'm not gonna comment on that, but I think you know that to be true. We are assertive on the basis of our rights, but what we see here from this mom is a rightless assertiveness. A rightless assertiveness. It's an assertiveness on the basis of who she knows Jesus to be not on the rights that she thinks she has. has. Have mercy on me, she says. I deserve nothing, but I know exactly who you are. What she's essentially saying is I'm not asking for what I think I deserve on the basis of the good that I have done, but I'm asking that you give me what I know I don't deserve on the basis of your goodness and what you have done. And friends, 
there was a, 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 what do you call it, a switch bait. Is that what it's called? Because the sermon is actually not about great faith. The sermon is about putting faith in God on the basis of what he has done, not coming to God on the basis of the good things we think that we have done. Great faith, yes, is desperate. Great faith, yes, is persistent. Great faith, yes, is great because we put our trust in a great God. And yes, great faith is humble. But above all, friends, if you take one thing home, take this home, that we don't approach God and we don't ask God for the things that we deserve on the basis of our goodness. Because when is our goodness enough? When have we prayed enough? When have we read the Bible enough? When have we given enough? When have we shared the gospel enough? Friends, we approach God and we ask God for what we know we don't deserve on the basis of His goodness, His perfection, His purity, His holiness. It's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter five, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we become the righteousness of God. Our sin placed on him, His righteousness, his perfection, his holiness placed freely on us. As we end, I want us to look at the very next account because actually it drives home the very points that we've been looking. Look at verse 31. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and he went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. There's so much in this verse. Just again, as an aside, this is another beautiful picture of intercession. The friends bringing a man, pushing past everything they they needed to in order to bring him into the presence of Jesus. Why did Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears? Why did Jesus touch his tongue, touch his tongue and then touch the man's tongue? This is not some new healing ritual that Jesus is following. Jesus is communicating to him, he's deaf. He was communicating to him that he was about to open his ears. He was communicating to him that he was about to loose his tongue. That's the beauty of the savior that we serve. This man couldn't speak and, 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 and Jesus is about to, to heal him. He came empty handed. He, he wasn't even able to ask for healing. This is almost the exact opposite of the mother. The mother pushes through, pushes through the disciples' uh, objections and everything that she needed to and cries out to Jesus, have mercy. This man couldn't even communicate his need. She came with great faith. He came because of the faith of his friends. But Jesus heals them both. Jesus identifies with them both. Jesus will go to the cross ultimately and bear the punishment that will ultimately, that would bring them healing and healing for us. Jesus became mute. He did not say a word to his accusers so that in him, we could be able to declare the praises of God. Jesus became deaf. His father actually turned away from him. He became deaf to the voice of the father for a moment so that in him, you and I could have a relationship close enough with the Father where we can hear his voice. The Son of God became a dog, so that dogs like you and I can become sons and daughters of the Father. That's the truth of the gospel. Friends, just like you, this man, this mother, had a desperate cry from their heart that they knew only Jesus could answer. And they did, and he did. This man and this mom had a situation that was impossible and overwhelming and they knew Jesus needed to break in. And he did. The point I wanna leave with you all is this. We can trust him. We can come exactly as we are, 
whether we have great faith or whether we, have, we are trusting on the faith of friends of ours here. We can come exactly as we are because he knows exactly what we need. Do you remember the whiteboard? First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. First the Jew, Jews get to feast on the banquet table, then the Gentiles. Do you know what, friends? That was before the cross. You and I don't need to eat off the scraps from the table. We get to feast at the banquet of the Lord, at the banquet of his goodness and grace and mercy and kindness. I wonder if the worship team could come up. I would love for us just to end with a song and provide an opportunity for us to respond. Friends, I'm asking, I'm gonna be inviting anyone here today who is trusting for a touch from the Lord. I can't know every situation. I don't know the circumstances that you are facing. It might be an affliction or a sickness that you are dealing with and that you are asking God to, to break through and bring healing. Perhaps it's, uh, it's, it's, it's anxiety and, and torment that you are facing in your heart or in your mind that you need breakthrough from. Perhaps it's just a situation that is overwhelming that you need Jesus to break into and to burst wide open with His goodness and grace. Perhaps today you have great faith to push past everything and come and receive from Jesus. But can I ask, and can I say this? Perhaps you don't have any faith. To which I would say, could, would you be brave enough to respond on the faith that I have to pray for you? And I believe that is a biblical thing to say. There are at least two occasions where friends brought their friends before the Lord on the basis of their faith and God moved in their lives. And so I'm asking, in the moment, we're gonna get the ministry team up and these men and women and myself are full of faith for God to move in your life. And so even if you don't have faith for God to touch you, but you are desperate for God to touch you, would you be brave enough in a moment to come forward so that we can pray for you? Before we sing, I'm just gonna ask everyone if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes, because I do wanna ask for those who are here today who do not know Jesus, who might not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I wanna invite you today to respond to the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel, friends, is that we don't have to do enough to receive blessing from the Father, but we come simply as people of need, trusting that what Jesus has done for us would be enough for us to be reunited with, with the Father in relationship with Him by faith in Jesus. Jesus paid it all. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose again three days later to defeat the guilt that sin carries. And as we put our faith in who He is and what He's done, the Bible teaches that we have relationship with God the Father. If that's you today, if you're saying, Steve, I wanna know Jesus. I wanna know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Or perhaps you know that you've walked away from God and the Father is calling you back today. I'm gonna ask you to be brave and to raise your hand because I would love to lead you in a prayer this morning where you can enjoy relationship with God the Father through faith in Jesus. If that's you today, Steve, I wanna know Jesus as my Lord and Savior or I wanna come back to the Father. I know that I've walked away from Him. Could I ask you to respond just by raising your hand? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else who wants to respond this morning? As you've raised your hand, I wanna just lead you in a prayer. Maybe you could just say this where you're seated. Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love. Thank you for your pursuit of me. Thank you that even though I may have grown cold, thank you, Father, that your love for me never has. Thank you that you have called me back to yourself today. Thank you that your arms are open wide and I come into your presence. I pray, Lord, that your love would overwhelm me, that your goodness would shower over me and that I would know that I am forever a child of yours. Lord, would you bless, would you pour
pour out your spirit upon those who responded to this this morning in Jesus' name. We're gonna sing a song and then we're gonna invite the, the, the ministry team to come forward and then I'm gonna invite you to come and receive prayer and trust that God would do great things in our hearts. Let's stand together.